So now we're slicing straight through the brain and looking at side view. And so the most obvious thing that you see in the side view is the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum is this huge white fiber tract just taking nerves that are going from one side of the brain to the other. With people who have really, really bad epilepsy, one of the things that happens is epilepsy seizure starts on one side of the brain and then propagates across the corpus callosum. And once you get on both sides of the brain seizing, you, you fall unconscious. So what do they do? They cut the corpus callosum uh, in some of these patients. Now I think they only cut certain parts of it and leave a lot of it intact, but they used to cut the whole thing down, and these patients were known as split-brain patients. And there's a really fascinating psychology experiments they've done where they can flash something like an image to one eye, which goes to one side of the brain and is processed on that side of the brain, and another thing like a word which goes on, and you can compare with the person, how the person sort of reconciles uh, a word versus an image, and they've come up with, you know, sort of hypotheses about how one side of the brain is for reasoning, the other side of the brain is more artistic and spatially, and so, you know, the, you hear about left brain people and right brain people, and uh, that's called lateralization of different uh, things, uh, and I don't know, I don't put a lot of stock into lateralization. Um, but certainly people are left-handed or right-handed, and you'll find that speech areas tend to be on one side of the brain or the other. And one of the things when you're trying to find out what parts of the brain to remove, you one of the first things you try to figure out is what side of the brain does a person use for generating speech. Because if, if the seizures are originating on the other side, then you can um, remove it without as much worry that the person is going to develop an aphasia or loss of ability to speak or understand speech. So here is a sulcus. Uh, that separates, well, I should point here, uh, the, the occipital cortex of the visual system and the parietal cortex. Uh, another really interesting anecdote is um, they take in MRIs, fMRIs of Buddhist monks while they are meditating. And when the Buddhist monks feel that they have this sort of nirvana feeling, they sort of look to see what part of the brain is actually active or hypoactive, and they found that the posterior parietal cortex seems to be hypoactive during that feeling of nirvana. And so they one hypothesis is that part of the brain is involved in representation of your body. And when you suppress that activity, you suddenly feel like your body is gone you are no longer just limited to your body. You go out and, and become part of the universe. And there's also patients that have particular strokes, and, and there's some really nice anecdotes in Oliver Sacks' book, like The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, where he had this guy whose arm was falling off, uh, the gurney, and he comes up, the doctors take the arm and put it back on, and the guy's freaked out. He's like, you guys keep putting this arm in my gurney, and I don't want this arm here. And they're like, well, but is this your shoulder? He's like, yeah, that's my shoulder. And he's like, well, is this your arm? He's like, yeah, that's my arm. And then, but there's a complete disconnect between his ability to recognize that that's actually attached to his body and that that's actually his arm, and he keeps throwing it out of bed. And he is corresponding to these strokes in this posterior parietal cortex. So cingulate gyrus, this is, happens to be a big gyrus that sits right above the corpus callosum here. And we'll find that they'll go in and stimulate different areas down in here um, for elevating people's moods, for uh, treatment of depression. Also originally done by looking at what brain areas were hypoactive in patients who have depression and then going and saying, well, maybe we should just stimulate that area and maybe they'll, they'll feel better and, and finding that they actually do. And then there's the cerebellum, which is associated with uh, refining motor movement. And so there's you know, a couple kinds of memories. You have memories which are procedural memories, which are actually trying to do something like playing a piano. And then you have memories, which I'm obviously losing. There's sensory kinds of memories, like you know, somebody can flash up an image and then ask you something about the image, and you can sort of shut your eyes and actually sort of probe around that visual image and actually answer questions, even though 
uh, it was after the stimulus was applied, so your ability to sort of store images for a little while. Um, but the cerebellum uh, is involved in, in all of these movements like playing the piano and refining it and you know, our ability to stop thinking about how to do something. In fact, when you're learning, you originally start by sort of uh, going through sort of a set of instructions like playing tennis. Well, I got to like place my feet first and then I got to swing and I got to make sure I carry through. And then at some point that actually becomes limiting to you in your ability to perform that task well. And at some point you have to stop thinking about it and let it become more reflexive. And that's when you sort of move to the next level of competency in a task. And that's really when you sort of switch from learning it um, using more hippocampal memory to I think learning it with cerebellum uh, where you're actually refining the pathways and doing things like making sure you're using the minimum amount of effort to, to accomplish a task, which makes it much more efficient. And then the pons is involved in, in that huge projection. It's just a, a random anatomical thing I threw in there. So, but the, there's a lot of pathways coming from the cerebellum back into the spinal cord or the brain stem um, in through the pons. And then there's the medulla. And the medulla has a ton of, we'll find that all these nuclei for um, all the cranial nerves are sitting down here in, mostly in, in the brainstem. 